Grace, mercy, and peace be with you all from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. On this second Sunday of Lent, we find ourselves with Jesus and the disciples in the eighth chapter of Mark's Gospel. But for a moment, let's go back to the beginning. The very first thing Mark told us, chapter 1, verse 1, is that this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. So we need to pay attention to what Messiah means. Mark, of course, is very economical with words, and he wastes no time in telling the Messiah's story. In just 17 verses of this gospel, we get some John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism and temptation, and the calling of Simon Peter and Andrew. To them, Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. That sounded pretty good to them, so they followed right along. James and John were next. Then, a lot of mostly good things happened. Preaching, teaching, healing lots of people, filling out the twelve and giving them the authority to cast out unclean spirits. Some parables, stilling the storm, that must have been an amazing day. He was rejected in Nazareth, though, and John the Baptist was killed, and that had to be very rough on all of them. He fed thousands of people with a tiny amount of food and walked on water, again, amazing. He had a dispute with the Pharisees, and he talked theology with the woman at the well. And that brings us to the eighth chapter. Just before today's reading, two things happen. The first is that Jesus cures a blind man at Bethsaida. If there was a sort of bracket around this section in Mark, chapters 8, 9, and 10, this first account of the healing of a blind man would be the first bracket. Jesus will heal another blind man later. This hints that we might want to have seeing and sight in the back of our minds as we continue. Just after this healing, Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am, and who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. He is the first person to say it out loud. He nailed it on the one hand, but on the other hand, not so much. Peter saw Jesus as the king the Israelites were expecting. Remember, at this time, the Jewish people were living under Roman authority. They had been conquered by the Roman Empire and absolutely hated it. They had read the prophecies of the Old Testament, and they were expecting a Messiah figure like David to arise, a warrior king who would lead them in fighting against the Romans and throw off the shackles of oppression. It's what we all would have thought if we had been among them. But of course, this is not our Lord's mission. It's not what he came to do. And he needs his disciples of all people to understand that he will not be a warrior king. In order to save the world, he must be the suffering kind of Messiah, as the prophet Isaiah described. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Jesus would be that kind of servant, that kind of Messiah. And all of this brings us up to today's reading. This is where things start to go south for the disciples, because Jesus needed to teach them about what was coming and what they had signed up for, with nothing hidden, no small print, no secrets. He tells them that the Son of Man, that's him, must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the people in authority, and be killed, and three days rise again. We're told that he said all this quite openly. Now, in my mind, for some odd reason, I imagine the disciples lounging in the shade, maybe they're texting their friends, eyes on their phones, and when Jesus says that part about being killed, they jerk their heads up and say, excuse me, I must have heard wrong. 
We have been healing and teaching and feeding thousands and casting out demons, for heaven's sake. We are attracting huge crowds. Things are going great. It's all good as is. And Peter, of course, was also having none of this suffering talk. He took Jesus aside. The Jesus he had just called the Messiah. He took him aside to correct him. How might that conversation have gone? Now, Lord, didn't we just agree that you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God? You've got this wrong, Lord. He's probably patting him on the shoulder by now. No more of this dying talk. Let's just get on with all the good stuff we've been doing. And by the way, when are you going to kick out the Romans? That should be your next step as Messiah. And what a blow it must have been when Jesus turned to them and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. What did he mean? Well, Satan means adversary. Peter was, at that moment, not friend, but adversary. He was against what God was doing in Jesus and instead was seeing everything purely in human terms. He thought it sounded good earlier when Jesus invited him to follow him and fish for people, but now he wants to lead Jesus in a different direction. He needs to get behind Jesus again, supporting him and following his Lord's lead. And Jesus, being an honest Messiah, didn't stop there. He went on to tell his disciples and the crowd around them what it meant to be his disciples. Straight up, no sugarcoating, he talked about denying themselves and taking up their cross and following. That cross language, you know, was very literal. It probably sounded so awful that I imagine they didn't hear the rest of the teaching about if you want to save your life, you must lose it, and so forth. Jesus, of course, knows these people, and he loves them. He knows this is a lot to take in, shocking even, confusing. And although he knows they don't get it the first time, he really needs them to understand, because otherwise they will miss the whole point of his ministry, that he came to give his life for the salvation of all. So he keeps on teaching them about his suffering and death and what it means to follow him. In chapter 9, he comes back to it. He explains it again, and Mark tells us they didn't understand, but they were afraid to ask questions. And then they argue about who among them is the greatest. So no, they don't get it yet. Jesus responds, be like servants, be like children, the least by the world's standards. And then in chapter 10, he goes through it with them a third time, explaining we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and after three days he will rise again. He doesn't even withhold the details. And how do they respond? James and John want the honor of sitting at his right and left in glory. No, they don't get it yet. Again, Jesus talks about servanthood. His followers are servants. What follows this is the healing of another blind man, the second healing, Bartimaeus. It's the closing bracket around this section of Mark with Jesus' three teachings about his suffering and death and what it means to follow him. How much do the disciples see at this time? Are they blind to who Jesus is, or are they beginning to understand? Well, we know they have a pretty steep learning curve ahead as everything plays out just as Jesus said it would on Good Friday. But after the resurrection, after he appeared to them, and when the Holy Spirit set them on fire, then they saw so clearly that they took up their crosses and they spread the good news of life and salvation in Jesus Christ far and wide. They both lived and died for their faith. So what does this mean for us? 
Last week, Pastor Westermeyer spoke about repentance in terms of God opening our eyes to see what God is doing right now, right here in front of us, so that we may see it and be a part of it. We asked what, that God could change our way of seeing so that we can worry and be distracted less and instead focus more on how Jesus is leading us in this time and place. What if we thought about this week's reading in a similar way? What if we prayed that God would heal our blindness so that we can see what God is doing, especially today, in the suffering places and people of this world, the cross kind of places, and we pray that we may be a part of what God is doing there? What if we started by being honest about our own brokenness? And what if taking up our cross and following meant that we would be willing to embrace the pain of someone else that God puts in our path? Not judge it, not explain it away, but try to understand it. And what if we decided to deny ourselves in terms of letting go of the insulation we're so tempted to wrap around our lives to keep the suffering of others out? and instead prayed for the courage to be aware of another's pain and to bring love to it. Why would we do such a thing? Because we believe and trust that God is clearly and totally present in the brokenness of this world. And from there, with us there, is calling us to life and healing and when we make this discovery that God is not absent, but instead wholly present in our brokenness, well, then courage is kindled, hope is kindled, change is possible. And after all, if loss and suffering and death cannot separate us from God's love, then what is there really to fear? So, my friends, has God put something on your heart? that is your situation to enter, a pain of the world or of your neighbor that has your attention? Are you called to stand with someone seeking fair treatment or keep faith with someone with dementia who no longer remembers you? Or to know and advocate for homeless families or hungry people? Or keep vigil with someone who's getting close to heaven? Or befriend a refugee? or sit quietly with someone who mourns. Whatever that hurting place, that cross place is for you, know God is there with you, calling forth resurrection and a new life. A blessed Lenten journey to you all. Amen.